it's good to me that it's interesting to me because I don't have much experience in it that um, your journey doesn't begin with oh, I'm self harming or I was drinking so much or my partner was beating me up. You know, like it's not like um, yeah, it's it's not cataclysmic. No, it's, I mean, it sounds very, very painful and, you know, and I'm not yeah. trying to diminish it. But what I'm saying is, is like, it's an interesting entry point because it's, it seems that there's not a requirement for you to be sort of like criminalised or hospitalised. Yeah. That, that's a very good point and it's a very interesting one. And I think um, the reason that I wrote about my experiences actually is because they aren't exceptional. Therefore, there's an entry point level for people who might be dealing with um, with the same kind of failure. It doesn't get a lot of airplay, the stuff that I went through partly because it's a seen as a woman's issue and and like what what is seen as a woman's issue fertility so uh i wrote a whole chapter in the book called failing at babies the reason i wrote that is because when i was going through ivf there was nothing there was no literature there was some hysterical internet forums that can tell you anything you want them to say but there was no book that i could look at that would tell me exactly what i was going to go through and what i might experience there was shelf upon shelf of mother and baby books once i got into the infertility treatment world i began to understand that I, my experience was going to be i was going to be treated by 98 percent men mm. um and they because they are men didn't have any experience of what I was going through. So a miscarriage would be, would be, uh, it, um, it would be compared to experiencing a heavy period by a man. And I'm like, well, you don't know what a heavy period is and you've definitely never experienced a miscarriage. So where are you getting this language from? You, you don't, you physically don't understand. So someone must have told you that or you read it in a medical textbook, but there's no reality. If you've actually been through it, that's not the reality. It's an incredibly traumatic thing. A lot of the language around fertility medicine was the language of failure. It was designed to make me feel like a failure as a woman. So I was told uh, that my uh, womb was inhospitable because <laughs> it's a certain shape. My friend was told that she had an incompetent cervix. I was told repeatedly that I was failing to respond to the drugs. And actually, it was my friend Fran who said maybe you're not failing to respond to the drugs, maybe the drugs are failing you. And it was a really momentous shift in my thinking because I'd been made to feel so diminished by all of this. And it was horrible and lonely and isolating. And I wanted someone to have told me that. And so that's why I wanted to write about it. Why do you think that language is so condemnatory and cold? And what do you think this says about um, patriarchy? That kind of stuff? Well, I think it says it's deeply, deeply embedded. And the reason I talk about it so much is that I want to excavate our shame and hold it up to the light so that we're no longer ashamed of it. We've been made to feel like failures as women because we're not fulfilling biological imperative it suits the patriarchy for us to feel like that it suits the patriarchy to keep us as brood mares just popping out their children while they rule the world and that kind of language has meant that quote unquote women's conditions have been marginalized in all medical terminology so it's only relatively recently that we've started speaking openly about endometriosis and which what does is, that mean it's um it's a condition where you get extremely heavy and painful periods or polycystic ovaries like i just hadn't i hadn't got a clue and i was a woman <laughs> and i i can say you know i can say i yeah it's just if you hear anger in my voice it's because i've been really hurt by it and I've recently had another miscarriage and it was and is really horrendous. And I really feel for women who are kind of made to feel that they have to go through it on their own at home. That's the medical advice. Before 12 weeks, you're kind of just left your own devices bleeding at home in terrible pain. And this is something that I feel like in any other medical condition, you'd be in hospital. A doctor would be checking up on you. Yes, it does reveal some interesting unconscious assumptions and uh, dynamics between the sexes. I've wondered before if agriculture began with the idea that females were to be regarded as a kind of utility, you know, and that that idea of command over nature and dominion over nature began not with non-human species but within humanity itself it's very interesting to 
hear the uh, amount of uh, suffering that that takes place within that and also feels to me as like an indication of the absence of necessary connection around biological human experience. I, I mean to say that this kind of uh, outsourcing and institutionalization of it, like obviously there are reasons to out institutionalize health there are financial reasons progressive reasons but it seems that we have um, become more machine like we're becoming more machine like and extra the, there's an extraction of the necessary connection in the, from what you said that, that 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 language sounded like it lacked humanity and when uh my wife was pregnant she we went in the hospital and i remember because of laura sort of learning about it and teaching me about it how much the process of medicalizing was a kind of system of unconscious domination it was really fascinating mm. to watch like that if you medicalize something that then you're dominating it entirely it's interesting to see how frequently and uh ubiquitously the the controlling of the feminine principle or the creative principle or femaleness or whatever you want to call it is built into social systems definitely and built into language from the off any oh. kind of language not just medical language so that idea that simone de beauvoir explores about the feminine always being the object rather than subject of the sentence it, so much of it is built into the prison of our language and yet language is all we have to connect on a vocal basis so so we're sort of it's, it's a difficult business being human. But actually, the original thing that you asked me was about um, my failure being a certain kind of failure and not necessarily a kind of cataclysmic oh, yeah. reaching the end of the road with um, drug or alcohol abuse. And I, I would like to say that I know that I speak from a position of extraordinary privilege in that I am white, middle class. I own a laptop. I'm in the top 0.5% of the global population for those reasons. And I cannot hope to speak to the experience of a person of colour, someone who's homeless, something, someone who's living with a chronic illness, and nor would I seek to speak to that because it would be immensely patronising. And I'm very aware that some failures are more easily assimilated than others. And I'm not here saying, I want you to fail better. And if you're not failing better, then you're failing at failing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there will probably be a necessary grieving process to any failure that you face. And that's a necessary thing to go through. You have to go through grief, not over it. But once that period has come to its natural conclusion, I personally choose to believe that failure has taught me something. And I might not always understand what it's taught me, but there will eventually be a lesson in that somewhere. And that's personally how I choose to live. Yeah, it seems like a good method. Thanks for watching this podcast and going all the way to the end of it. Would you be so kind as to click the bell? It might not be there, but over there. And uh, subscribing so that we can infiltrate your serenity and peace of mind with jangling bells and buzzes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>